Ubisoft. Is there a company that has ever made more games? I mean, seriously, take a scroll through the wiki page of every game they've released in just the last 10 years alone, and even the biggest of video game enthusiasts will be stunned with how many games they've had their hands in the cookie jar on. Now, I know many of you have waited patiently for the next Dark Age video, but these things, you know, they take time, and even longer when you release 20 bajillion video games that I gotta play and talk about with extreme detail, but hey, Look, here we are, living in the dark age of Ubisoft, we're here, the video has arrived. This company has been through the ringer, to put it lightly, in the last few years. Reports of toxic workplace conditions, a negligence to respond to those conditions, and for the cherry on top, a developer that is so incredibly creatively stagnant. Despite the variety of series that they own, which pioneered the open world genre in the mid 2000s, they are equally responsible for destroying it many years later. However, much of Ubisoft's destroyed reputation is the result of a death of a thousand cuts in my eyes. Going back and combing through all of their major releases, I remembered something most profound. Ubisoft actually kicked ass at one point, and that makes all of this the more frustrating. This is the studio that many people point to being the problem in gaming, and they were once a trailblazer in our industry. So, let's wind back the clock to 2001 and dissect precisely what happened to this once great gaming titan. Ah, look at this. Small beginnings. Yep, what you're looking at is Batman Gotham City Racer. In the early 2000s, Ubisoft built their name by striking deals to nurture large pop culture IP, the most notable being Batman. They also made the Nintendo DS version for the Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith movie tie-in game, which is actually one of the best side-scrollers on planet Earth, mind you. On the other end of the spectrum, one that I, I like a little bit less, Ubisoft made the TMNT tie-in game for the criminally underrated movie that dropped in 2007. Anyway, Ubisoft's foray into Batman came after Konami had their fun with some quality side-scrolling beat-em-ups for the Cape Crusader, most notably being the adventures of Batman and Robin for the SNES. Originally, the game that you're looking at here was called Batman Vehicle Adventure upon its announcement according to an article by IGN that was published in 2000. Sluggish controls and repetitive objectives really hurt this one according to reviews. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I hate to spoil things and say it ends how it starts, but, well, Ubisoft published and published, not developed, one of the worst games of all time. Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. This one left me downright traumatized, okay? I don't know how you have a hero so cool and you put a game so bad, but... Oh. Oh. It was Chemco. <laughs> Okay, never mind, that checks out. But this is only the beginning, right? Ubisoft saw the bat signal and answered with a vengeance. Hey, whoa, whoa, guy, hold up. We just cleaned the fucking floors. You mind taking your shoes off before you come in here, you damn savage? Oh, oh, my bad. L let me take these off right here. There we go. Sorry about that. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Justice Not Sponsored by Farah. How the hell can I help you? I are... Uh, oh, sorry. Are, are you guys open? No, pal. I'm here on my free time. I like working. What do you think? Oh, okay, good. Um, are you? Are you, uh... You selling any of those Justice Burgers? Yes, we do here at Justice Carry the Justice Burger. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Can I get one? One Justice Burger? All right, hey, one Justice Burger! All right, should be done in a couple minutes, pal. Justice. Arriving mere months later, in the same year of 2001, is one of my favorite superhero games of all time. If there is one game I can actually quote from front to back, this one is it. I played Batman Vengeance a disgusting amount of times growing up. What's more fascinating is, as I dug through old interviews for this video, this game was being propped up as a true next generation experience. Conversations with the developers always asked about the difference between the GameCube and PS2 versions, how they managed to accomplish a vision so close to the animated series that the game was based on, and even how much storage space would be required when saving the game, which would come in at a heaping two blocks. 
Batman Vengeance really was an atmospheric game, as hilarious as that may sound, okay? Bear with me. Seriously, this scared the hell out of me growing up. Crawling through the cops, frozen by Mr. Freeze and the monstrosities that Poison Ivy sent your way, the darkness that shrouded the game, and the fact that the game even opens up with Batman removing a bomb strapped to a woman as the building explodes behind you and you slide away. It's genuinely good stuff across the board, and this is where outside of something like Rayman, Ubisoft made their first footprint in gaming. Like this this is a AAA developer. Fun fact, Reed Schneider, the producer of Batman Vengeance, who spoke to IGN around the game's release, expressed his desire to have Catwoman in the game. Interestingly, he went on to serve as executive producer for the Batman Arkham games, beginning with Arkham City, the one that introduced Catwoman. Not saying he's responsible for it, but I thought it was kind of cool. Two years later, Ubisoft decides to throw all the atmosphere, the next-gen hullabaloo, and the dark storytelling out the window for Batman Rise of Sinzu, a beat-em-up that I have a love-hate relationship with. You clearly had something great with Vengeance. You were the next-gen boys leading the charge in 2001, and then you tossed it away for a mega-linear game with couch co-op as the focus. I, look, I guess I shouldn't complain. At least Ubisoft experimented back then, so... Yeah, some swings, multiple misses on the Batman front. At the same time, and this is going to be a frequent theme throughout because they were putting out a ton of games at this moment, Ubisoft embraced a unique partnership that would make heads turn nowadays. In 2001, Ubisoft and Capcom started a relationship that would last for many years. In a seven-game publishing deal, Ubisoft agreed to bring Game Boy Advance games to European audiences. One of them being the definition of my childhood, Mega Man Battle Network, as well as one of the best pixel art games of all time, Breath of Fire. This would continue even to 2006, where Ubisoft would announce that they're helping Capcom bring Devil May Cry 3, Resident Evil 4, and Onimusha to Europe as well. Maybe I find all of this fascinating because I live in America, but it reminds me of our Dark Age of Bethesda video, where we learned that 2K, Bethesda, and Ubisoft collaborated on the publishing of Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. Just those really odd entanglements, sorry Will, I should say, these partnerships you would never really see nowadays. You'll actually see Ubisoft's name tied to a lot of Japanese games published in Europe, such as Grandia 2, Fatal Frame, or even Drakengard 2. Okay, how about we switch up the pace and go into something more familiar for current Ubisoft fans. Tom Clancy is synonymous with Ubisoft nowadays. The Division, Rainbow Six, Splinter Cell, Wildlands, Breakpoint, Ghost Recon, X Defiant, which that's no longer the case, but you get my point. This relationship all began with Red Storm Entertainment, who would build some of the first Ghost Recon games. Red Storm Entertainment, being co-founded by Clancy himself, the team that would go on to lead the charge on the PC-centric games that were published by Ubisoft, and these were military simulation-style games involving you crawling through open maps where an enemy could be hiding anywhere. There was true danger wherever you went. Yes, a mighty difference from the loot vomiting we see in, say, The Division. This game did strike at an awkward time. Games like Operation Flashpoint were dropping to great success, and I say this as a lifetime New Yorker, 9-11 had just happened two days before the release of this game. At its time, it had, like many of us, shaken up the development team and challenged what kind of games they would make. It dramatically shaped storytelling decisions, as one interview shows that they originally were creating a storyline for Desert Siege involving Bin Laden before the events of 9-11 occurred. They didn't want to get too close to realism and backed off, opting for another story. It's fascinating to see how the series managed to find its footing for the general public despite its proximity to a world-changing event. Ghost Recon games would pop out nigh on an annual basis until 2007. Eventually, in 2008, Ubisoft would buy the rights to Tom Clancy along with Red Storm Entertainment, which, fun fact, is still up and running today beneath the Ubisoft banner. Meanwhile, another Tom Clancy game would take the world by storm. Much like Batman Vengeance, Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell would leave a permanent impact on many gamers. So much so that people had to beg Ubisoft to do a traditional Splinter Cell game as they senselessly milked fans with cameos, mobile game appearances, and everything except a mainline video game. It was like it was rocket science explaining to these folks why we wanted this game. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Interestingly, Ubisoft said in an interview with Xbox Addict that Splinter Cell was born out of a desire to stop making games for kids. They were making a, a Donald Duck game and they went, enough of that, we're gonna make 
Splinter Cell. This is a stark contrast from the reason that they make games in the Tom Clancy series today. Watching as an Xbox exclusive, this game redefined stealth, as the, the box art would say. Sorry, I know it's a, a shameless ripoff here, but I mean, really, that's what happened. The pure silence crawling from level to level as Sam Fisher, and all you'd hear are some light footsteps, the beeping of a nearby computer. There was just a level of immersion here that not many had seen for its time. I can also say, as a kid at the time, remembering playing these games and holy hell did I have some problems with them. I remember playing the Chaos Theory demo disc and just losing over and over due to its complexity. Something as simple as, I don't know, opening a door would actually stump me. But as a young adult now, age 26, I can't help but appreciate its interactivity. Lock picks to open doors, hiding bodies in dark spaces of a level, interacting with computers to get data for your mission. Many of these things I actually still love in video games today, and my first exposure to them, and I believe this is the case for many others, was right here with the first ever Splinter Cell game. The series would take off from there, and only two years later in 2004 would we get Pandora Tomorrow, the sequel to the original Splinter Cell game. It would be built off much of the same systems as you know, but now this one, wait for it, included outdoor areas. Holy shit, what a dramatic improvement. Okay, well, in all seriousness, this was a big deal back then. I mean, look at most of the levels in the original Splinter Cell. They would largely keep you indoors. Pandora Tomorrow wanted to strip away some of the claustrophobia the series had and largely succeeded. Game after game, we'd get continuous Splinter Cell bangers until one day, it vanished. Not kind of like the Avatar, but it really did vanish. Splinter Cell Blacklist arrives in 2013, and it's largely absolutely awesome, rivaling what I think is the stealth goat Dishonored. It presents a similar level of freedom that not many stealth games do. However, that'd be the end for Sam Fisher. For many, it would be a head scratcher as to why a critically and commercially successful series would disappear, but money talks. Ubisoft made money with Tom Clancy as they molded it to fit all of the modern gaming sockets we know today. The live service socket would be where they'd plug in The Division. The competitive first person shooter socket would be where they plug in Rainbow Six Siege. The open world socket would be where they plugged in Wildlands and Breakpoint. All three of those games were vital to growth and destined for monetization no matter how good some of them were. Whereas those tactics would be much more difficult to employ on something like Splinter Cell, a largely single player stealth focused game. Don't get me wrong, Pandora Tomorrow introduced multiplayer to the series, Blacklist had its own spies versus mercs mode, but it was never ripe for microtransactions like the others for Ubisoft. My personal favorite in the entire Tom Clancy family still remains Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter. Seriously, the voice acting, SOCOM levels of coordination, and Republic Commando level squad bonding here just draws me to this game. The gunsmith allowing for customization before each mission led to me replaying this bad boy multiple times in my high school career. Still, this is only one vertical of the Ubisoft pie known as failure. So let's jump to the year 2003 where Ubisoft dropped Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Okay, wait, wait, look, I know I've thrown a lot of games your way, so let's actually collect ourselves for a moment and recap. Ubisoft dropped Batman Vengeance, Ghost Recon, Splinter Cell, and Prince of Persia all in a three year span. As I said at the top, they were good, and we haven't even sniffed some of the other more popular franchises. I'll say the quiet part out loud though. Prince of Persia walked so Assassin's Creed could run. The parkour, the combat, the behavior even of enemy AI, the weird way the time period would work, all of this would be tools for Ubisoft to take from Prince of Persia and build upon with the first Assassin's Creed. While dating back as far as 1989, Sands of Time would serve as Prince of Persia's entry into the mainstream, and many people's first time hearing about the series. Certainly I'm speaking for myself here. This meant the series would be going from 2D to 3D and present challenges in design. Many interviews surrounding the game would focus on the traps littered throughout the level, something you would actually come to expect nowadays in 3D game design. The AI advancements were also noteworthy as Farah would be a competent companion who could fight with you and react to things that you, the prince, would be doing. Perhaps the biggest change of them all would be the action combat injected into the series alongside its parkour. 
It wasn't until Warrior Within, just a couple of years later, that we would see the fruits of the labor as they built upon the framework with the animations that are still impressive here today in 2022. I mean, I don't even think the commentary can do it justice. Look at some of this combat here as you flip over enemies, bounce off walls, and do all sorts of just crazy stuff. And what's insane here is that Prince of Persia's Sands of Time, for many, was a runaway Game of the Year winner in 2003. And five days before it released, another hit from Ubisoft was waiting, Beyond Good and Evil. So remember that list I just said a moment ago? Batman Vengeance, Ghost Recon, Splinter Cell, Prince of Persia, add another to it. It's still 2003, and if you haven't figured it out yet, this is why people loved Ubisoft at one point. These were all bangers, and more importantly, as new IP, you could separate each franchise from one to the other. Much to people's dismay, I was very hard on Immortals Phoenix Rising in my review in 2020. I stated that this game as a brand new IP did not do nearly enough on a design level to separate itself from Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, or Far Cry's bloated and familiar open world design. Despite being a brand new thing, much of what made it a video game was pulled straight out of its brother and sister franchises. What I loved about the early 2000s Ubisoft is that they weren't hesitant to sink their teeth into new ideas and run away with them. Again, look at this list in three years and think of how different it was for each of them. Batman Vengeance, Ghost Recon, Splinter Cell, Prince of Persia, and Beyond Good and Evil. Not a single one, even Ghost Recon and Splinter Cell being in the same family under the Tom Clancy brand are like the others. That is creativity, especially when a lot of these were top-notch. Sadly, Beyond Good and Evil has had its sequel eluded for years. Despite Ubisoft's announcement of it, many believe it will, unfortunately, be canceled, as it has been since 2016 when that game was announced. Sad face. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. It's still 2003. Ubisoft has another game for you. Releasing two weeks ahead of Beyond Good and Evil and three weeks ahead of Prince of Persia is none other than 13. Yes, yes, the remake is god-awful, but the original launch of this game is one that I hadn't heard of until, well, well, that terrible remake I just told you all about. However, the original was a cult classic that set you in a stylish, cel-shaded FPS game that stuck closely to its graphic novel roots. Unlike Prince of Persia or Beyond Good and Evil, this one received mixed reviews, but many adored it, thus eventually willing this remake that... God, man, what happened here? Like, seriously, this remake is abysmal. Ubisoft had no involvement in this, surprisingly, but still, the chance of any possible sequel is officially gone with this remake. Thank you, Microids, for publishing this one. You did a great job. It's time we jump ahead to 2007 to the franchise that quite literally shifted this company down an entire path. One that would take the ideas from Prince of Persia, make a new and revolutionary open world game for next generation consoles, and eventually go bigger and broader. Alongside it was the Far Cry series, which began to see growth with Far Cry 2. Have I ever taught you the definition of insanity? It's releasing the same game over and over and over and over and over, and over, and expecting different results. What if I told you that they're also behind this? This is insanity, not this. This is insanity. Future game developers, watch closely. You're about to see how repetition, too many cooks in the kitchen, annualizing a open world game that is completely bloated and loading the screen with directives everywhere that you're hand-holding people through the entire game can slowly poison your own well and kill the genre that at one point you pioneered. How did Ubisoft rise to the top? I mean, look at so many open world games that came out after Assassin's Creed and Far Cry. So many of them follow the same formula. Well, Assassin's Creed and Far Cry hit at a sad time that couldn't have been any more perfect for the budding open world producer. You see, there was a studio before them that was defining open world games, Pandemic Studios. This team was responsible for Mercenaries, The Saboteur, and Destroy All Humans. Of course, they were better known by many for creating Star Wars Battlefront, but this was a studio that, much like Ubisoft, would put out solid gold in consecutive releases, albeit at an unsustainable pace. I had the opportunity to learn more about the collapse of that studio that I conducted on my old podcast, Ham Radio. 
and they specifically pointed to growing too fast and output as key reasons to that studio's closure. They closed down in 2009, thank you for that EA, and there was Ubisoft, just releasing Assassin's Creed 2 to fill the power vacuum, almost immediately upon creation. They were the answer to many people wondering where they would get their open world games next. Not that there weren't others in development, but when Ubisoft happened to drop their most widely beloved game at the same time, it made that transition very smooth. I really loved Assassin's Creed when it first dropped. There was nothing like it. The hidden blade, the aesthetic, blending into the crowd. It was fresh, much like everything else that they had been producing for years beforehand. But Assassin's Creed is a tough series to talk about. I've been there, playing all the games through since the very first one. I watched as people slowly got tired of the games they once celebrated, watching Ubisoft go as far as to even put out a movie of the game, and eventually bloat the games more and more with content. The credits would roll, and you'd see thousands upon thousands of names, all hard workers who wanted to make sure they stamped their name in the game they were working on. What you'd be left with are open worlds with a mishmash of inconsistent ideas and mechanics that ultimately felt far too big for their own good. By the time your standard consumer was finishing one Assassin's Creed game, out came the next. However, as people demanded more for change and got it with the likes of Assassin's Creed Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla, an even louder crowd began to percolate asking Ubisoft to go back to the ways of old. The changes in Origins, Odyssey, Valhalla were much more action-focused, stepping away from the Animus, stepping away from Desmond's story, which it concluded in Assassin's Creed 3. As each entry rolled out, you could see the conflicted developer that saw good numbers in the people buying their games, but was afraid to change, and then the burgeoning microtransactions, or as they call them, time savers, that would help sustain the development of these games. Ubisoft had put themselves in a pickle. In turn, the design of these games would be corrupted. Even newer Assassin's Creed games I liked, such as Assassin's Creed Odyssey, would become far too fattened up with content that had low XP payouts in a world coated with level gates. It became obvious for many what the priority of Ubisoft was, and how the modern game design template that they had created in many ways had become a very big comfort zone for them and had pushed them into this corner. That latter argument is more solidified by the Far Cry series. Functioning much like its Assassin's Creed counterpart, you're dropped into a world, dripping with collectibles as you check off boxes via completing activities awaiting you. Of course, there was Far Cry 3, which really for a lot of people was the open world game. However, as time went on, the lines began to blur. It was one thing if Assassin's Creed took this route, but then so did Far Cry. The cost of making games was exploding. Ubisoft went from risk takers to seeing what worked and stuck with it. It was rare you'd see them go off the beaten path and drop something like, say, Far Cry Primal, which insisted you played the game in a different way, but still had a lot of the familiar beats from that formula. When I played Far Cry 6 in 2021, and I saw the mission where you blazed up a field of drugs, it's like I had this epiphany that either Ubisoft is so scared to experiment since the cost of failure is so high with today's games, or that their design is borderline masturbatory, with their obsession for reusing the same bag of tricks over and over again, hoping that the same group of fans continues to buy in. It's fine if it works for you, but these series serve as both the birthplace and graveyard for people's love for Ubisoft and open world games. However, I would be remiss if I didn't speak about the Ubisoft anime era. Yes, really, Ubisoft was the pioneers of some great anime games, but much like they were the product of good timing when it came to Pandemic Studios, they were the product of bad timing when it came to their foray into anime video games. When they were creating games like Rise of a Ninja and Broken Bond, some of the best Naruto games out there that really captured the open world experience that brought RPG elements to one of the best animes to ever exist, there, out of no Nowhere came Ultimate Ninja Storm after four mainline Ultimate Ninja games, five if you count the one out in Europe, then they took over. Everyone was looking at the flashy graphics, beautiful art style that is still aged phenomenally to this day, and a lot of people moved over from the Rise of Ninja hype, from the Broken Bond hype, over to more of that Ultimate Ninja Storm goodness. And I don't blame them, those games are great, but there's a surprising level of depth, of character building, of world building, done in Rise of a Ninja, done in Broken Bond. And while they're not as flashy and smooth as a fighting game as Ultimate Ninja Storm, I still feel like these games are way too often forgotten about. And I think because of that bad timing where they saw their anime games were doing worse compared to others out there, that they had something working for them in the name of Assassin's Creed and went, well, let's just 
run in that direction completely. But was that well and truly the case? Was it really just a design idea? Was there really creativity lacking in these departments? Well, beginning in 2020, it was revealed that Ubisoft had trouble on the home front. Bloomberg had published a report stating that Ubisoft's workplace culture was toxic with rampant sexism, racism, and homophobia. Many long posts were being made by current Ubisoft employees on Twitter who were calling out those who had abused them, leading to an internal investigation by Ubisoft themselves. Several senior heads at the top of the company were removed, but perhaps more relevant to the consumer is the old school stance many had on who should be the face of their games. Cassandra, the best part of Assassin's Creed Odyssey if you were to ask me, was not able to to be the main protagonist of this game. The reasoning, you may ask? Ubisoft stated, women don't sell, <laughs> if reports are to be believed. Mind you, these were things said when games like Tomb Raider, Horizon Zero Dawn, Hellblade, Celeste, Dishonored 2, Nier Automata, Life is Strange, Bayonetta, and Mirror's Edge all existed and many of them thrived. So yeah, pretty out of touch as that's not even scratching the surface. Reports surfaced the following year that Ubisoft hadn't amended the issues with their workplace environment. After swiftly denying that wasn't the case, Ubisoft eventually conceded that they did a bad job with this, and now many of us are still hoping to see change. For Ubisoft, it was not only an internal problem, but an external problem. It wasn't just the game design, it was the game's presentation. Yes, it's time for us to talk about E3. While sadly, and yes, I do say sadly and mean it, E3 is likely dead and gone at this point in time, Ubisoft was one of the largest proponents of posing a gameplay demo that never ever came remotely close to representing the final product. It was attached directly to their name with things like the first Watch Dogs game, which had complete differences from its final launch. Rainbow Six Siege, among many others, Ubisoft consistently lied to fans, and the things they developed were woefully feeling undercooked, especially on a visual level. They were at the heart of gameplay presentations for E3 going south. Every single game they showed you felt like borderline false advertising. And then you throw on top of all of that the fake gameplay commentary they do with people actually talking about the game in game chat when that would absolutely never be the case. And you had a really bad look across the board. But it doesn't stop there. Ubisoft got caught up in trend following. Again, as you notice, the reason I front loaded this whole video with a lot of positive Ubisoft talk is to create the idea that they were once creative, they were once great, and then you look at the trend following they did, that battle royale game they made that no one remembers that they eventually shut down. What system didn't they support? The Vita came out, the Wii U came out, Ubisoft had Zombie U out. Ubisoft was on top of every single trend, even to this date now where we have NFTs and Ubisoft tried to introduce their own court system. There isn't a single trend that Ubisoft isn't foaming at the mouth for and hopping on top of. It's a complete rarity that you see something with originality come out of them. By that, I mean something like Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle, and I cannot wait for Mario and Rabbids Sparks of Hope. Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle symbolized a brief moment for some of us that went, there is a team in Ubisoft somewhere that has a creative liberty to take Mario, uh, obscure Rabbids franchise, and turn it into an XCOM game and make something fun and completely different. This is the Ubisoft many of us fell in love with, but when you look at the internal problems they have at their studios, the E3 gameplay presentation, the trend following, and the absolutely repetitive game design, Ubisoft has put themselves into this corner. And it's not just here and now in this moment in time. You look to the future, they're working on a Star Wars game. They're working on an Avatar game. But also, they're working on platforms for Far Cry, for Assassin's Creed. No longer will they be releasing individual games that people like and enjoy. They're putting it on a platform and continuing to push these series in the direction of monetization, in the direction of live service. The Ubisoft that we all knew and loved has been dead and gone for a very, very long time. But often I see people point to the reports of workplace culture as being why Ubisoft is a dead company at this moment in time. And while that is a big component of it, there's a much more grand story here that I hope I did a good job of portraying to all of you. This is indeed the dark age of Ubisoft. And as someone who is and has been a big fan of their games for really my entire life, starting off with Batman Vengeance, I hope they can find a way out of it. But really when you look at what they've set up for the future, 
Granted, we don't know much about Star Wars and we don't know much about Avatar, but they are building up live service games, NFTs, and it doesn't look like they're gonna be changing a direction at any point in time. It's really sad to see. And so now it looks like moving into the future, we'll continue to see the occasional moment where a Mario and Rabbids, a Trials Fusion will pop up and go, hey, there's the old Ubisoft, but otherwise their most major output into this industry will be much of the same. And it's sad because when you look at where the industry is now, Elden Ring withstanding, many open world games feel, look, and play the same. The mechanics, the exploration, the activity-driven moments, all of that was born by Ubisoft. They could have led us into another era of open world games. Instead now, they've been lapped as they've become stagnant. Elden Ring took their place and now hopefully people will follow that level of design moving forward. Unfortunately, we'll get some shoddy copycats, but at least it's a breath of fresh air compared to what Ubisoft has built. Anyway, that's all I have for you in this video today. Thank you so much for watching. This is the Dark Age of Ubisoft and it's a video completely supported by you over on Patreon. So if you did enjoy this, consider supporting over there. I would certainly appreciate it. It's why these videos take a long time to go. And with that, I'll catch you all in the next video. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.